It's the middle of July in 2014. You're an artillery soldier in the Ukrainian army stationed near the border town of Izverin, hoping that the politicians can sort out the problems in Donetsk and Lugansk before Russia intervenes. Your unit isn't the best equipped in the world, but you're no slouches. You know the situation and you know the stakes. You've studied Russian artillery pieces and you know their capabilities. You have forward observers in the most advantageous positions who will provide early warning and targeting information should they see any evidence of mobilization. You're confident that with your preparation and position, you can deliver effective fire on the enemy if they try to cross the border. In the distance, you can hear a faint buzzing sound like a distant lawnmower, and it fades away. 90 seconds later, everything around you is exploding. People are dying and you have no idea why. This was a common scenario in the opening salvos of the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. The Russians were using small unmanned aerial systems, or UASs, to remotely target Ukrainian troop and equipment concentrations at great distances using cameras, rangefinders, and GPS attached to these flying intelligence gathering machines. For the Ukrainians, whose counterfire doctrine rested largely on human data collection as opposed to counterfire radar capability, this was disastrous. Russian artillery dominated the battlefield, and despite technological support from the U.S. in terms of counterfire radars, those UAS still pose a great problem to Ukrainian soldiers today. The story would only be marginally better for the United States if we were in Ukraine's position as we do not currently have an effective active defense against small UAS. With $60, anyone can become a nuisance to US forces. With greater investment, this nuisance turns into a real threat. The sophistication of small UAS vary from cheap and short range think of the small multi-rotors with the camera and the GPS that are popular today, to long-range, munition-carrying, highly maneuverable aircraft. An example of the latter is the Harpy UAS, a radar killer. It's a cruise missile with wings, and it has a ridiculously large loiter time of several hours. This UAS is so dangerous because it's an ARM, an anti-radiation missile. It seeks our electronic eyes, our radar sensors and destroys them by kamikaze into them once it detects them. Because its radar cross-section is so small, many radars that are designed to find air threats never even see them coming. The one thing that all types of small UASs have in common is what I stated before. The US military currently has no effective way to actively counter them. That is to say, the military's air defense community, whose job it is to neutralize enemy aircraft and missiles, predominantly the ones that are already in the air and headed toward a friendly site, do not have a way to destroy these threats with an acceptable degree of accuracy or guarantee of safety from fratricide. The current marching orders are half steps. Find and target the operator, or indiscriminately bombard an area with repurposed electronic attack capability. But these are an inefficient and ineffective way of dealing with the threat. These small UAS represent a gap in our technological capability and the U.S. military needs to quickly develop and field this system to actively counter them. Don't get me wrong, we are not defenseless. We have always employed passive measures to counter the threat. These are things like good camouflage that will prevent both manned and unmanned aircraft from finding you in the first place. Things like dispersing formations in such a way that one attack won't damage an entire unit. Creating barriers capable of defeating a kinetic attack from an IED equipped UAS. And deception operations to mislead the enemy about where you are. But all of these things only mitigate the utility of the enemy's capability. It doesn't take it away from them, which is the ultimate goal. In order to accomplish this goal, the military is looking into these active defense capabilities and have generated some interesting ideas and prototypes for inclusion into tomorrow's fight, which will undoubtedly involve small drones, regardless of the level of conflict. Some longer range threats operate in contested space, 
meaning that friendly aircraft are likely to be in the area. Without a precise targeting capability, an attack on these types of UAS, kinetic or non-kinetic, carry with them an unacceptable risk of fratricide. To address the UAS threat, an Italian company has developed the Falcon Shield, a system that combines radar, infrared, daylight cameras, microphones to detect the distinct sounds a UAS makes, and devices able to detect a drone's radio signals and track them back to its operator. What it doesn't have is the most important thing, a way to disable the UAS. Even if this technology were fielded tomorrow, it wouldn't be useful to maneuver units as it is not easily set up or torn down. Several companies have developed radio wave guns. These are rifles connected to a power source that saturate a contained area with directed radio waves, interrupting an operator's ability to control the UAS and potentially disrupting the UAS GPS feed, confusing its position and preventing it from using an automated recovery feature that returns it to the operator's position automatically. While field tests confirm these guns' capabilities, none are particularly useful in a military setting, since the guns that have the necessary range are too bulky for combat use, and those that are the right size and weight are ineffective at the necessary range. The bottom line is that more research is needed to make this active defense measure work. Researchers at Michigan Tech University developed a multi-rotor UAS that deploys a net to snare other small UAS and fly it away from the area. The intent being protection of friendly assets, as it would do little good to shoot down a UAS with an explosive that could trigger when it hits the ground near friendly forces. This solution has its own set of challenges, as it relies on the operator's skill in maneuvering and targeting in a situation where there is only one shot at capturing the target, at which point the UAS must return and be rearmed. All of these technologies have promising features that would be absolutely useful to the force. But time is not on our side, and it hasn't been for some time. What do I mean by that? Well, it's been almost half a century since the last credible non-ballistic missile air threat to the United States. Since then, the military has focused on missile defense, which is why we have the Patriot, Aegis, THAAD, and GMD systems providing a highly effective safety net protecting Americans from ballistic missiles, and only the 36-year-old Avenger system, the CRAN system, and pilots in manned aircraft to protect from everything else. It is likely that the next conflict that the U.S. military engages in will involve a credible air threat. And that threat will comprise more than just fixed and rotary wing aircraft. It's going to involve a range of threats, combining manned aircraft with crews and ballistic missiles and small UAS. Working together, the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines can fight and win against those first two types of threats. But the small UAS threat leaves us in a vulnerable position of relying on passive defense measures, measures that have not been properly exercised in a very long time and are rusty within the force. If we want to dominate the battlefield and seize and maintain air superiority and eventually supremacy, we must find a way to actively defend against small UAS that is better than a marine sniper shooting it out of the sky from a helicopter, which is a real tactic that was floated and actually tested at the Black Dart exercise in California, an event dedicated to finding answers to air defense issues. The Marine made the shot, proving the viability, if not feasibility, of this active defense measure. But it shows that the military is exploring every option to counter small UAS. Speaking of the Marines, to date, the Marine Corps is the only service to publicly announce a contract with a company to develop an active defense against small UAS and there is no predicted date for initial testing, let alone complete fielding. The Army's plan is even more opaque. The FIRES community recently concluded the 2017 FIRES conference, where air defenders laid out their top priorities. Active defense against UAS was number three, behind updates to ballistic missile defense systems. And there were no significant announcements or timeline estimates for new active defense technology development or testing. This is not a good sign. Our fighting force will depend on air defense in the next major conflict more than they have ever before. 
If they aren't equipped to provide that defense, then the risk of failure grows. We must learn the lesson that the Ukrainian army had to learn the hard way, that small UASs are a tool that can be used to great destructive effectiveness in the hands of a force with the requisite knowledge and intent to wreak it. So far, we have only learned and acted on half the lesson. We have given small UAS to our infantry formations and reconnaissance elements and rely on them for data collection to support decision making. We use them in a similar way that the Russians use them, albeit with less maneuver to fire synergy, which the US is currently improving. The other half of the lesson is the one that I'm focusing on today. This is the lesson that defense against small UAS targeting and strike capability is just as important as mimicking the capability to use against an adversary. In an operational environment where an adversary can fire and forget a small UAS, using our offensive capability to target an operator does little good. In this case, the best defense is not a good offense, but an active defense. These active defense measures will one day be introduced to the force in comfortable amounts. In the meantime, commanders must listen to the advice of their air defenders and implement their suggestions to better their passive defense. It's the best way to mitigate this capability gap, and it could mean the difference between the life and death of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines in the next major combat operation. Thank you.